application by default, and it doesn't specify whether you want to do create or update or delete. It does all create, update, and delete. It's up to the developer to then dive in and specifically disable all of those unnecessary um, methods if they don't intend for users to, to access them, as well as enforcing any sort of uh, authorization authentication. So I think this is a really good example of where the GUI-driven development makes it very easy for somebody to shoot themselves in the foot and inadvertently expose full create, update, delete access to a bunch of back-end tables um, that they may not actually realize they're doing. So a couple points to note here on, on RIA data services. Um, the, the interesting thing is the way that these services work is it actually uses an HTTP module that gets installed within the web.config um, that automatically creates sort of virtual endpoints. So um, the good news is that metadata is not exposed, so it doesn't turn on the, the WSDL, it doesn't allow MEX requests by default, um, and it creates these virtual endpoints that are somewhat hard to find if you don't know they're there. The, the .svc file is not on the file system. The, it's not defined in the web.config file. The, the module is dynamically doing this at runtime based off some auto-generated classes. So it makes it very hard to find these things if you don't know they're actually there. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you see the submit changes method, this is the method that gets automatically created when you check that enable editing box off. So as soon as you have that submit changes method there, um, you can potentially create, update, and delete all the data that the service is exposing, depending on whether they've gone the extra mile and, and enforced any sort of restrictions on that. So I mentioned before that the, 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 the good news, at least from a security or the bad news to the attacker, is that under this scenario, you don't have metadata. So if you're trying to attack a web service, you're really dependent on figuring out the different methods that are exposed based off of using something like the SilverNet client, Silverlight client. So the good news is that you can easily decompile that client, and whether they're using all of the different methods or not, unless they've specifically stripped some of the interfaces out of the, uh, the ZAP file or the XAP file, which is the Silverlight file, all of the interface methods are going to be in there, and it's going to give you essentially all the same data that you would have normally gotten through the, uh, the WSDL. It's just going to be a little bit harder to find. So I'm going to show you quickly how you would do that. This is actually an application that was written with uh, the RIA data services. So if I actually just do a, uh, a view source on this page, and I go down to the um, find out where the actual um, zap file is embedded here, um, and you can see it's right over here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that into my browser and it's going to prompt me to download the file. I'll just download it to, uh, to my desktop. It's already there, but download it again. And luckily, the zap file is nothing more than a zip file. And the zip file includes uh, all of the different .NET binaries that the Silverlight runtime needs to, uh, to actually run the application. So I'm going to go ahead and just extort, uh, extract all of these um, files to a folder here. Just give me a second. The machine's a little... I'm running two VMs for these demos, so the machine is a little bit sluggish. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just extract this to, uh, to a folder. It's already there, but I'll just overwrite it. And then what happens here is in this folder, this is the contents of the zap file. You can see it's basically just a bunch of DLLs and a, uh, and a manifest. And if you were to open any of these DLLs in .NET Reflector, um, all of the system.windows and system.service DLLs, those are just standard DLLs. They're not going to be interesting. This HR app is really the custom DLL that you're probably going to be most interested in. So if we actually go through and we, we start browsing this, I'm personally not a big fan of browsing code in Reflector. Um, it's not the easiest to use interface. Um, and it's kind of hard to dig around in the code. So normally the first thing I do is I just highlight the entire DLL and I'll do an export. And that will actually just disassemble the entire project to, uh, to a folder into whatever language you want. I've got C-sharp enabled here. And it will even go so far as to, uh, to generate a uh, Visual Studio project file. So you can actually open up the code just as if you were looking at it um, in Visual Studio. So if I go ahead and open up the, uh, the project file here, I think I may need to convert it because I think it does a, an older version of Visual Studio, but that's uh, certainly not an issue. Um, once we convert it, you can actually start browsing through the source code 
um, and really digging around and looking at the different uh, classes that are in here. One of the tips that I'll normally recommend is look for anything that's using the system.service model class. So domain services, the domain service client is the RIA client. Um, the service model, the regular service model client is just going to be for any other type of web services. This is normally going to be, and again, I apologize for the resolution. This is going to be the class that has all of your different interface methods for the web service. So you can see here that it actually declares a URI that includes the path to our SVC file. So immediately now we've already got, think about where we were a minute ago where all I was able to do was invoke that login mechanism and I knew that that login service was there, which I go, if I go back to, um, to our, our burp log here, it's basically the authentication service. There's actually several other services back there as well. This is an organization service. And then what you'll want to do is actually scroll down. Eventually, you should probably find just an interface that has all of the different methods defined. So here, for example, I can see there's a get employees method um, that's exposed right here. Uh, you can see here that it looks like um, they even allow web gets to this method. So if I actually just plug that in, and I've already got it uh, lined up here in burp repeater, if you actually go to, uh, if I just go ahead and plug in the organization service instead of the uh, authentication service, and I change the method to get employees, and I'm doing a get here, and I just hit go, what's going to happen is, it doesn't even matter what's here, this is actually, if you look down at the, the request body, that's actually the request body from my uh, login uh, request. I'm just doing a vanilla get to this method. And again, it's, I'm not even sure if you can see it here because of the screen resolution. But you can see the OK. And let me just try to copy and paste this all to a text file. Well, there's a lot more in there than just that. Um, if I'm, I'm scrolling, you can only see one, time, one line at a time. I apologize for that. I'm not really sure how else I can get this to render. But essentially what's happened here is this get employees method, as I mentioned before, when you're creating these, these RIA services, all you have to do is check a box, and it's dynamically going to generate a virtual endpoint. And unless the developer goes through and, and adds a, an attribute to every single service that says this service is authenticated, requires authentication, um, you may be able to just anonymously invoke some of these services and pull out data. This actually dumps out a, a, a list of all the employees in that application. Um, another thing to keep, it, keep an eye out for as well is I mentioned that that submit changes method, if that's defined, that means they've checked that box that says allow, um, make this interface uh, or make this service um, editable, in which case now you can potentially do creates, updates, and deletes. So the the bottom line here is that even though you don't have metadata exposed by default with an RIA service, you're normally going to have a zap file, and that zap file is going to give you all the information you need. So just some pointers there. Look for system.service model in your decompiled code, and also look for the service contract attribute, which is normally going to be on top of your interface. And that'll basically just give you all, a list of all the different methods that you can call. So. That's scenario one, which is um, Silverlight. And I think that's going to be clearly, if you're looking at client-facing, customer-facing applications, that's going to be your number one scenario. Another, there's some other scenarios that you may only see between B2B or app-to-app -app sort of um, environments that are certainly worth uh, pointing out. The first one here is what's called uh, a duplex, duplex bindings. And this is really just a, an interesting thing that I happened to, to stumble into when I was looking at the different bindings. There's one binding in particular. So duplex bindings are bindings that allow two-way communication. So think about um, your normal web service is basically just a series of requests and responses between a client and a server. In a duplex binding, the service actually has the ability to push data real time back down to the client. So there's a bunch of different bindings that support two-way communication. Um, one of them in particular operates over HTTP. And the reason this is interesting is if, if you think about HTTP, it's really a one-way protocol. So the only way to establish two-way two -way communication, other than some sort of a polling mechanism, which there is another binding that does polling, um, this one actually opens up a callback channel on the client machine 
And that callback channel is used by the server to push data back down 